Good evening. I'm Rachel Floor, Executive Director of the John F. Kennedy Library Foundation. On behalf of my library and foundation colleagues, I'm delighted to welcome all of you who are watching our first entirely virtual Kennedy Library Forum online tonight. As we gather together this evening, we hope most of all that you join America and the Lowell Institute and our media sponsors, the Boston Globe and WBUR. We look forward to a robust question and answer period this evening. You'll see full instructions for submitting your questions via email or comments on our YouTube page, the vital center of education and exchange and thought, which will grow and change with the times. Those words have guided us through the years, and while we can't convene the gospel, including the event, John F. Kennedy's call to service remains one of the most consequential acts of presidential leadership in American history. His simple challenge to ask what you can do for your country forged a new understanding of public service and redefined what it means to be an engaged citizen. Now, nearly 60 years after JFK was elected president, these values have taken on a striking new importance. During the global pandemic of COVID-19, we see the impact of public servants at every level of government on our collective future. We bear witness to the courageous citizenship of those on the front lines and we reflect on the stunning power of individuals acting on behalf of the greater good to protect the most vulnerable. In short, this crisis underscores the ideals that President Kennedy championed and the lessons we learned from his example today. We are so grateful to have this timely opportunity to explore the challenges presented by the coronavirus in depth with our distinguished guests this evening as we all look for the healthiest and most effective next steps ahead during these unprecedented times. I'm now delighted to introduce tonight's speakers. Helen Branswell is the infectious diseases and global health reporter for STAT, a media company focused on finding and telling compelling stories about health, medicine, and scientific discovery. She came to STAT in 2015 with 15 years of experience covering health with a focus on infectious diseases. Helen was introduced to epidemic reporting during Toronto's SARS outbreak in 2003. In the years since, she has written about bird flu, the H1N1 flu pandemic, Ebola, Zika, and now leads STAT's coverage of the coronavirus pandemic. David R. Williams is the Florence Sprague Norman and Laura Smart Norman Professor of Public Health and Chair of the Department of Social and Behavioral Sciences at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. He is also a Professor of African American Studies and African Studies and Sociology at Harvard University. His research has enhanced our understanding of the complex ways in which socioeconomic status, race, stress, racism, health behavior, and religious involvement can, can affect health. He is the author of more than 475 scientific papers, and he has served on the editorial board of 12 scientific journals and as a re reviewer for over 75 others. I'm also so pleased to introduce our moderator for this evening. Rick Burke is the co-founder and executive editor of STAT. He was previously a longtime reporter and editor at the New York Times, where he was chief political correspondent for more than a decade. In his roles as an editor, he served two tours as an assistant managing editor and was also Washington editor, national editor, political editor, and video content editor. Before coming to Boston to launch, launch STAT, he was executive editor of Politico. Please join me in welcoming our special guests. Good evening. I'm Thank you so much, Rachel. I'm pleased to have this Kennedy opportunity Foundation. to have a discussion with two very authoritative to people who know so much about this pandemic. And it's particularly timely to have this discussion today because of these, the Senate's extraordinary first hearing today on the coronavirus. We'll do our best to live up to their technical standards, which were a little hit or miss. So please, please bear with us. But let me let me start now with Helen. You were the first reporter in the United States to write about the this virus coming, this potential pandemic, January 4th, I believe. What what has that was like five long months ago. It seems like years at this point. What <laughs> surprised you since about how this has all played out? Um 
I, I guess the speed at which things have happened. Yes, it does seem like a very long time ago, but you know, I'd been working for years sort of reporting on what could happen if a pandemic occurred. And I knew some of the things to look for, things like supply chains breaking down, shortages of personal protective equipment for um, healthcare workers, food shortages, things like that. I was surprised at how quickly they all happened. And one thing I was particularly struck by is you had a story not long ago about the magical thinking early on in January and February, where you were interviewing many authorities, many who you respected, or you still respect, who were, who were sort of in denial. Were you, at that time, when you were interviewing those people, were you thinking, why, why don't, don't they realize what's coming? Or were you yourself surprised at how this, um, the, 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 the scope and scale of this pandemic? I was surprised, you know, um, in mid-February, I moderated a panel at the Aspen Institute in um, DC and on the panel was Tony Fauci, uh, the head of NIAID, uh, Nancy Massonier from the CDC, who was then the CDC's lead person on the pan, you know, the emerging pandemic, and uh, Ron Klain, who had been the Ebola czar during um, the Obama administration for the Obama administration during the 2014 um, West African Ebola outbreak, and even then, you know, people on the panel kept saying, you know, we're not seeing it do outside of China what it's doing inside of China. This was several weeks after China had locked down Wuhan. You had tens of millions of people you know, virtually locked in their homes to try to stop the spread of a virus. And I just could not get my head around why people thought the virus would behave differently outside of China than it was inside of China. And I was puzzled by the lack of urgency and the lack of speed in terms of response measures being taken. And, and you know, the next week, uh, <laughs> First, Iran reported like an explosion of cases and then Italy erupted. And then we saw that indeed the virus acts the same way wherever it goes. David, you had an excellent editorial yesterday in JAMA about how the pandemic underscores many race, racial and ethnic disparities in our, in our country. Can you talk a little about patterns that you're seeing? Yes, uh, the patterns we are seeing are quite striking um, and actually surprising uh, to many Americans. Uh, for those of us who work in the field, it's not that surprising. What we are seeing is that uh, in almost every state where there are a large number of deaths, the, the death rate among African Americans um, is, is much more than that of the population, uh, percentage population of African Americans in, in that state. And it's quite striking in some places like Detroit um, or, or Chicago or New Orleans. So we, we see the disproportionate negative impact. And by the way, I, I was in a, a, a conference this morning virtually in, 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 in England, and it's exactly the same pattern there. Um, the, the big point is COVID-19 did not create racial disparities in health. It's simply shining a magnifying glass on disparities that have existed for over a hundred years. The pattern of elevated risk of disease and death exists uh, for the African American population and the Native American population for most of the leading causes of death in the United States. So COVID-19 is just one more example, uh, not a, a dramatic one, but one more example of a well-established pattern that we've observed for a long time. I was, I was struck in that piece about uh, some of the data where, where areas like the Bronx were so hard hit, and then you have Manhattan, which is a much more dense area, but predominantly white, where, where the numbers aren't nearly as as large. That too is not that surprising. In virtually every country of the world where we have data, 
uh, persons of higher income, higher education, higher occupational status have better health than those who are not as advantaged. And if you look at the demographics and the economics of, of the five uh, boroughs in, in New York City, Manhattan is in fact the wealthiest and, and the Bronx is, is, is among the poorest with, with also very high rates of residential segregation in the Bronx. And, and those are patterns that predict a, a, a worse profile uh, in terms of health. So again, not particularly surprising given what else we know uh, the determinants of health are. I, I would ask either of you to, to comment on one thing that, that's mentioned in that piece is an, a racial gap in empathy. And I wonder how the, um, the leadership of this country and sort of how the leaders view race may have affected our response to this pandemic. Um, let, let me begin uh, by, by pointing to the fact that, yes, it's a, a well-established um, in, in scientific circles. There was a review paper published a, a year ago that showed across the world, on every major continent, um, uh, individuals tend to have greater empathy, and they were not relying on the self-report of the individuals. They were watching them observe the suffering of, of other human beings. Some persons were of their same group and uh, other persons were of a different group. And they could see differences in brain imaging when you look at, observe someone of your own group versus another group. So it, it's, it's well established that in general, we tend to care more, we tend to feel the pain and suffering more of someone from our own group than someone from a different group. And by the way, that is not new. Um, in 1899, W.E.B. Du Bois wrote a book entitled The Philadelphia Negro. And in that book, he has a chapter on Negro health and he documents the disparities that existed for blacks in Philadelphia at the time. And as he came towards the end of that chapter, he says the most difficult social problem in the matter of Negro health is the peculiar attitude of the nation toward the well-being of the race. And Du Bois continued, there have been few other cases in the history of civilized peoples where human suffering has been viewed with such peculiar indifference. What he called the peculiar indifference, the fact that we as a nation don't really care as much about what's happening to this disadvantaged population is what scholars today call the empathy gap. Helen, you've covered so many different epidemics around the world. How has that played out in terms of the racial disparities, in terms of how local officials address various um, health issues for their populations? Um, well, I think, you know, you see it time and again where some portions of populations are disproportionately badly hit. I'm thinking about uh, the Zika outbreak in um, 2015, uh, you know, northeastern Brazil, where the vast majority of the cases of really profoundly damaged babies were born was also an area where, uh, you know, it, which was uh, economically disadvantaged and um, you know you you see that kind of situation play out where where people don't have the same advantages as as the wealthy there are as as dr. Williams has said you know a, there's a disproportionate burden of disease and of the you know scale of an outbreak like this Let, let's talk about expectations at the at the Senate hearing today, it was striking that Senator Lamar Alexander, the Tennessee Republican, asked Tony Fauci, uh, "Will students at the University of Tennessee, I think he said, be able to get vaccines and get back to school in the fall?" Right. And Fauci said, um, "Wait a minute, that's a bridge too far." And and uh, Helen, you've written about expectations. Could you tell us about? how vaccines work and what you see is a realistic timetable? Well, in, in very sort of brief terms, vaccines sort of um, 
prime a person's immune system to recognize an invader, whether that's a bacterium or a virus, and prepare you to fight it off if you encounter it. Typically, they take years to develop, you know, somewhere between eight and 10 years is a fairly good estimate of what a normal vaccine can take. Sometimes it's longer than that. And in this outbreak, obviously, uh, everybody's trying to bring vaccines forward in a virtually unprecedented rate. Um, Dr. Fauci himself probably helped to set some of those ex expectations. He's been talking about uh, p potentially having a vaccine within 12 to 18 months. But I think when he's talking about having a vaccine, he's talking about knowing that a candidate vaccine works. It typically takes you know, at least that long to test it, you need to be sure that it's safe and that it's um, um, efficacious before you start to use it. And then you have to have enough of it to make a difference. And um, over the past few months, as, as people have been working on these, there's been talk about maybe having some, the first vaccines that got out of the gate, maybe there will be data by September or early in the autumn to you to know whether they work and if they work that maybe they could start to be used on an emergency basis but that would be in frontline workers health workers and other frontline responders there will not be tens of millions of doses at that point let alone hundreds of millions of well there might be tens but there won't be hundreds of millions of doses to be deployed in the United States or elsewhere. And it's really going to take quite a bit longer. And the goal, of course, cannot be just to vaccinate the United States. I mean, the whole world needs vaccine and the United States won't be safe until other countries are vaccinated because as long as this, vac this virus is circulating, you know, people could get infected. It could be reintroduced, even if the United States controls it here, it could be reintroduced from elsewhere. Um, speaking of a vaccine and, and speaking of the Senate hearing today, Senator Patty Murray, the Washington Democrat, uh, who's a top Democrat on the Health Committee, asked Fauci about steps the government is taking to make sure people at different income levels and different racial backgrounds, particularly, particularly people of color, will have access to vaccines regardless of price. Um, Fauci replied that they are designing, selecting clinical trial sites to include representation from minority community, communities and others at high risk. David, is that is that enough for you? Do you think that what's your your take on how the government has responded and um, in terms of setting the, the 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 setting the standards for access once we, there is a vaccine? Um, so I, I think it's a good thing that uh, they are using diverse populations uh, in, in their trials. And it's something that needs to, we need to do more of in clinical trials. It's done, it's increasingly done, but, but we're still not where we should be. I think the bigger issue, though, is, is access. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, it's a problem we have in this country where every resident of this country does not have access to, to medical care. And, and that would be a good first step. It wouldn't solve the disparities problem because problems within the healthcare system is a portion, a part of uh, the disparities problem, but it, it's a good start. It's a good foundation to build on that everyone has access to care. The second step becomes everyone needs to have access to high quality medical care. And, and that's uh, one area in which, and, and I say this carefully because I have enormous admiration for the healthcare workers of this country who today are at the front line in, in being heroes in this pandemic, in providing high quality medical care. At the same time, I am very much aware of the fact that they are human um, and, and there are limitations they face, even in dealing with this pandemic. Back in 1999, the United States Congress asked the Institute of Medicine, today called the National Academy of Medicine, to answer a simple question. 
when blacks and other minorities go into healthcare context in the United States, does your race or ethnicity determine the quality of care that you receive? So it wasn't about access. Given access, does race matter in terms of how you were treated? I served on the uh, Institute of Medicine, it was called at the time, committee, and we don't create new scientific data, but we reviewed more than 180 published, peer-reviewed scientific studies, and over 80% of them found that across virtually every therapeutic intervention, from the most simple to the most complicated medical procedures, blacks and other minorities receive poorer quality care. Um, why that's really important, we think that a, a driver of it is it's not a conscious behavior on the part of most healthcare providers. Most healthcare providers wake up every morning intending to do their best uh, for all of their, their clients. But on the other hand, they are products of their society. And what research shows is that every society, every culture has in-groups and out-groups, groups that are viewed positively and groups that are viewed negatively. And that when we meet someone, in one third of the time it takes to blink our eye, we focus on their social characteristics, and if they are those that in deeply embedded in our subconscious, they are negative stereotypes, negative beliefs, negative assumptions, we will treat that person differently. That is, we will discriminate against that person. L and the processes of discrimination are more likely, of this implicit bias, is more likely to occur when people are working on the time pressure when there's complex cognitive information, when they are tired, when they are highly stressed. So the context of COVID-19 creates some of the very conditions that scientific studies have shown for a long time maximize the occurrence of these processes taking place. We don't have a lot of data that that is in fact happening, although there are anecdotal reports from both the United States and from the United Kingdom that suggest there may be some of that taking place. Helen, let me, let me ask you about the Centers for Disease Control. Um, one of the, the uh, themes of your coverage and in, in our conversations over these months have been their lack of playing a central role, a front and center public role during this pandemic. Can you talk a little about why that's a concern of yours and why that's different from what we've seen in the past? Sure. Well, first of all, the, the CDC is playing a central role. They're just not playing a publicly visible role. I mean, they are doing what they always do, working with states and territories, uh, territorial governments, trying to help them um, deal with this crisis. But typically in a, a disease epidemic or an outbreak or a pandemic like this, the CDC is sort of front and center giving the public the information it needs to make the types of take the types of of uh, actions that they need to keep themselves safe keep their families face safe know you know how to comport themselves that messaging is now coming out of the white house and as a consequence of that is it has become highly politicized and there are virtually two messages or streams of messages going out in this country you could have heard it effectively if you were listening to the senate committee today if you're a republican you view this one way if you're a democrat you view this another way and the virus doesn't care how anybody votes. It just is looking for throats to infect. But people are actually getting erroneous information or skewed information because of the fact that it is not an unbiased, honest broker like the CDC that is that is doing the messaging. And you know, I think the country is going to suffer as a consequence. You had a, an interview and in, uh, with CDC Director Redfield, and you asked him about this. Can you talk about that and what he said? I just asked him about the fact that the agency had been sidelined and how he had, you know, tried to push him on how he had allowed it to be sidelined. And I effectively told him the agency was invisible to the American people. Um, he he didn't agree, but. Um, you know, they aren't briefing. They haven't briefed since March 9th. That is an extraordinary length of time in a crisis like this. That's over two months. It's just, 
I couldn't, you know, if you had told me two years ago that this, well, not two years ago, maybe four years ago, that there would be a pandemic and the CDC would not be regularly briefing, I would have told you you were crazy. One one thing about we saw at the hearing today is the the one uh, administration official who seemed willing to step up and challenge the administration was was Dr. Fauci. Could you talk for a second, Helen, about your experience with him and your sense of him and whether he's an honest broker in your experience? He's a scientist and he's trying to answer questions about what this outbreak, you know, what shape this outbreak might take, what might happen if uh, the push to reopen the economy and get businesses back up and functioning again, if people take, you know, actions too soon and before the, while the virus is still circulating at a high rate, um, he's trying to do that in a, from a science-based perspective and facing people who aren't necessarily looking through the same frame. So yeah, he's been interesting. He has been willing to, um, he, he doesn't frequently, you know, completely correct people, but he will say, well, and he'll, you know, reframe information after the president speaks or after a senator speaks, trying to make clear that, um, you know, the danger still exists. The danger is still very great. There's no reason to think that this virus won't continue to infect people at the rate it was before if we go back to the behaviors we had before the lockdown. Uh, so trying to find, uh, you know, um, he, he's trying to essentially help the country find a safe way to do this. And um, I think it's a challenge for him. David, look, playing off what Helen said about the politics, can you make a connection between um, the, the political divide in, in, in between Democrats and Republicans in responding to this and how vulnerable communities have been affected and, and how their, the response for them has been handled? So, I mean, on the one hand, um, the Democrats and Republicans did come together and, and successfully passed two relief bills that, that provided assistance uh, both to average Americans, but also to um, our economic infrastructure. Many, many large companies, uh, as well as small companies, that, that are, are struggling as, as we cope with the economic impact of the pandemic. So um, I would say that that's a, a rare moment of, of bipartisanship we 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 saw, um, uh, um, you know, it, with the relief bills. At the same time, I, I think there are differences in emphasis in terms of how the money should be spent when we look at what what the Democrats see as priorities and and what the Republicans see as as priorities. Can you give One me of an the example. example. Um, I think the Democrats ha have been emphasizing uh, resources to individuals, resources to poor communities, um, and uh, the Republicans have emphasized uh, resources to, to big business in, in many cases, and, and even the, the, the monies that should have included a, a lot of small businesses, in fact, the money had already been used up by the time um, small businesses applications uh, were being considered. So th the important point to keep in mind, we talked about the, the impact of COVID-19 in terms of looking at the deaths within um, uh, uh, African-American communities, but I, I would hasten to emphasize it's not only African-American communities. The Hispanic community um, in New York has, has been devastated as well. And if we look at um, uh, um, some reports from many Native American communities, and I, I have a researcher who does a lot of work on the Pacific Islander uh, population uh, out, out in the west of this country. Those are communities that are also um, very vulnerable and also have been hurt. One of the things we have to realize is that 
the pandemic is not only having a devastating negative health impact, but it's also having a, a, a negative economic impact. And that economic impact is, is in affecting populations that were already vulnerable, economically vulnerable, before uh, COVID-19 showed up. Let me give you an example. I looked at uh, a 2019 report from the U.S. Census Bureau, the latest data on median household income in the United States. And for every dollar of household income white households received in 2018, uh, Latino households received 73 cents, Native American and African American households received 59 cents. So 59 cents to the dollar is the, the, the racial gap in income. What's stunning about a 59 cents figure is that it's identical to the racial gap in income in 1978. You, didn't, you heard me correct. I did not misspeak. In 1978, the peak year of the economic gains for the black population, as a result of the war on poverty and the civil rights movement, the gap had been narrowed to 59 cents. And in 2018, it's still 59 cents. It hasn't been stable over time. It worsened throughout the decade of the 1980s. Reaganomics was not good to the black community. But since 1994, it got back up to the 59 cents figure, and it's been a penny up and down from that. As bad as the income data are, those income gaps are, they dramatically understate the racial ethnic differences in economic resources because income captures the flow of money into the household. It tells us nothing about the economic reserves that households have to cushion shortfalls of income. We get that from data on wealth. And the latest Federal Reserve Board data suggests for every dollar of wealth white households have, black households have 10 pennies and Latino households have 12 pennies. So we are looking at groups that don't have economic resources, which means they are even economically more devastated by this pandemic. And I would argue that we should make a, a habit in this country of providing resources to individuals not based on income but based on wealth because wealth captures the depth of economic vulnerability that populations face let me ask you helen about data because whenever at stat we've tried to write about some of the breakdowns and who is affected by coronavirus it's, it's hit or miss what kind of information and what kind of specifics we could get from, from both the federal government and some of the local health agencies. Could you talk a little bit about um, the, the, any difficulties you've experienced in getting information in covering this? So I haven't been doing those stories, but I do know, you know, from talking to colleagues that, um, and, and from listening to other speakers in, in other fora talking about um, about trying to get a handle on how this is, is for instance, affecting communities of color versus, uh, you know, white communities, that some states are gathering those data quite clearly. I know that, for instance, um, California has been reporting quite transparently about the fact that it's seeing... Um, both higher rates of cases and deaths mm -hmm. in populations of color than those populations may, you know, in terms of their, pro 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 excuse me, their proportion of the entire community, they're, they're more disproportionately uh, affected by this. Some other states are too, but it's not across the board and it's not necessarily that easy to pull together at times. Do you find that David, that in terms of your research data is is hard to come by. Uh, um, there is data. I think we are getting. We are early in the. In the it's, it's just a few months in, but it's remarkable that there are a number of studies being published and so on. What I think is disheartening was the absence of racial data. And when I first went to the mm -hmm. CDC website to look at the data, racial data on deaths, um, it was upwards of sixty, seventy percent. Of, of, of cases where racial ethnic data was missing. That is very unusual. And, and it, it, you, with data is very 
helpful, especially in, in dealing with a pandemic. It, it allows you to identify where the hotspots are, where, where the, the problems are, and how to direct resources. So it's a useful tool for policymakers. So the absence of, of, of data is a challenge, but I think we are doing better that more and more data is, is, is coming into play now. Let me ask you, Helen, you, you've laid out a litany of mistakes that you think um, the U.S. has made in responding to the pandemic. And, and, they're one, and based on your conversations with a lot of experts and authorities, what would you put as the top, uh, the top mistakes that have been made and what has been done to address them? Um, I mean, I, I guess I would probably still say the top mistake was the the slowness to solve the problem of testing at the beginning. It, it you know, because the CDC's test initially didn't work that well in the hands of most of the states. Um, the virus got a chance to get out ahead of everybody and seed itself within communities. And because this is a very insidious virus because many people who have it don't um, have the types of symptoms that would, you know, scream killer virus here. They're just mildly sick or not even sick at all. And this was, you know, as it was taking off while flu season was on. So anybody who felt sick would could have thought, I just have flu. Um, you know, by the time the CDC and the FDA worked things out and other tests were rolled out and people started to test in large numbers, this virus was very well seated in a number of different places and, uh, trying to do what other places like China had, have done to get on top of it, to sort of know where it is and um, uh, do contact tracing, isolation and quarantine, trying to prevent uncontrolled spread. By that time, the house, the horse was not only out of the barn, it was, you know, several fields away, you know, with foals of its own, it was just gone. And, um, uh, you know, that, the country is paying for that and going to continue to pay for that for a really long time. And part of that was probably, you know, bad luck, people make mistakes, but the, the lack of swift action to make up for it or, you know, to find a plan B, I think really was a very bad mistake. David, do you, I see you nodding your head. I think. Do you do you agree? Have you uh, that 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 slow response was probably the biggest mistake thus far? I I, I would say so. Yes. Um, I I think we 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 had information and we discounted it. I I think Helen said it well. We didn't take it as seriously as we could have. And I do think that we could have been in a better position than we currently are if we had acted, you know, promptly when, when the threat was, was clear that was coming our way. Were you ever personally in denial yourself early on or did you see it coming? I, I think my, the, I would say in January, I, I knew it was coming. I, I thought it was, I likened it to the flu and, and the flu and pneumonia is, is one of the top 10 causes of death in the United States. And I would say initially, even though I am a professor in a school of public health, a chair of a department in a school of public health, I did not initially in the very early weeks um, really acknowledge or, or appreciate the, the, the scope and impact of it. I, I quickly learned my lessons there. Yeah. Well, you can, re Helen, you can reassure David, he's not alone in that. I got so many press releases, I have to tell you from, um, well, I, so many press releases, you know, from all sorts of places, but um, a lot of people were trying to make the point, you know, this is like the flu and this, you know, if you want to be worried about a virus, the flu is really a virus to be worried about. And I've written about flu for 
15 years. I take flu very seriously, but this was not just like the flu and it was driving me crazy. It still does, but I'm glad you, you, you no longer use that argument because you, you still see it in some quarters and That's true. people do not understand among other things. I mean, the, you know, whatever the, there's a lot of argument about how, what the infection fatality rate with this is, and it is probably higher than flu, but if, even if it isn't higher than flu in a regular flu season, somewhere around 8% of people in America, 8% of Americans have symptomatic illness with flu. A hundred percent of people in this country, more or less, minus the percentage who's who've been infected so far, are susceptible to this virus. So you can have an attack rate that is going to be much higher than what you would see in a flu season, and that just those sheer numbers make this a huge problem. David, I'm going to ask you a question. I think it's a really sort of impossible to answer, but let me let me pose it to you, and that is the when you talk about these vulnerable populations that are that are affected so hard by this. I remember Helen early on was saying, we've got to write about these populate. This is this is a big deal issue. Um, and and you talk, David, about the sort of these are sort of problems and policies that have been in place for decades and generations. And um, if you if you were sitting there, whether it's in the White House or you were king or had control of this country and could do something quickly to help these people who are most affected right now, wave your magic wand, what would you do? Well, I think for those who are hurting now, I would try to ensure they can get the optimal medical care they have, that everyone who needs testing can truly get it, um, and and that that all of the resources that are necessary so our healthcare workers on the front line can provide the needed care could do it. So that that's on the short term. Um, on, on the immediate term, on the, the somewhat a longer term, uh, I think we need to ensure that disadvantaged communities have the economic resources to get back on their feet, that small businesses can get back uh, to, to being successful economically, um, that jobs that are lost can, can quickly come back. I think that's on the short term. But long term, we really need to think of what we can do to what I would say, build communities of opportunity. Um, I, I, in one talk, I, I talked about the need for a Marshall Plan for disadvantaged communities. The way we rebuilt Europe after the Second World War, we need to have investments in poor rural communities in the United States, in urban areas, so that they, uh, the issue is having access to opportunity, opportunity for quality early childhood education, opportunity for high quality elementary and high school, opportunity to have the skills needed that you can earn a living wage and can provide for your family. Family. These social factors uh, not only strengthen us economically, if we have a more productive workforce that, that helps the, the country in, in, in terms of its economic productivity, it helps the country in terms of our global competitiveness, but many persons don't realize these are the same factors that drive health. When the average American thinks about health, we think about medical care. Actually, medical care, and this may sound irreverent, but it's true, doesn't have a lot to do with health. What do I mean when I say that? Our healthcare system functions as a repair shop that takes care of us once we get sick. It's not a driver of whether or not we get sick in the first place. So it's really the opportunities to be healthy in our homes, our neighborhoods, uh, our, our churches, our workplaces um, that really strengthen us, lower levels of stress, and, and equip us to engage in the behaviors that, that, that provide good health. That's what we need to focus on. So I, I like to think of communities of opportunity where everyone has the opportunity to have maximal and optimal well-being. Well, you did answer it, so <laughs> that was that was pretty good. Thank you. The um, let me now go. We have we have many uh, sharp questions from the audience. Let me go to uh, to a few of them. The um, one is that th this unprecedented situation presents a wide variety of mental health challenges 
with people from all walks of life. What thoughts might you have for ways to address such issues on a personal level and then on a community societal level? Either of you. Um, I, I can start and, and then Helen, you can help me. Um, certainly uh, when we think of the health impact of, of the COVID-19, we, we all must include a mental health impact. Uh, for most people, we have never experienced something like this where we are uh, socially isolating, where, where we are working alone at home for those who are able to work. Um, the, the emotional impact is, is quite severe. Um, and one of the things I think we need to do even now is to realize that the fact that we have to, we shouldn't really, at least some people would say, talk about social distancing. We need to distance physically, but we still need to be connected social, socially. We still need, we should not emotionally distance. Um, and, and even now, individuals can reach out to others and be a source of support, be a friend, uh, maintain, find ways to engage with others because this is a very difficult time for us. We also need to realize that with this massive loss of lives that have, has occurred so far in the United States, we've never quite had something like this when, when there are deaths in your family but you cannot come together as a family to right. support each other and to grieve together. So uh, the, the long-term mental health impact of this is, is serious, and we certainly need to think of the ways in which we can provide mental health services uh, to individuals who might need it, and, and all of us even now can reach out and touch the lives of others. Yeah, I, that's very eloquent, and I don't know how, that I can add much more other than that, you know, it's a, it's a time to be kind to other people. It's a time to help people. It's a time to be aware of what people are going through. I just this afternoon, I was texting with a, a scientist I know who I've known for years, and she told me her brother died yesterday in Minnesota, and, uh, you know, they knew he was ill. They could not go to him. He had no family with him when he died. They won't be able to have a funeral in the near term. I mean, people are grieving and in ways that are not, not normal for human beings. You know, we're being forced to experience this in, in really extraordinary ways. And, and I think it's just incumbent on all of us to be aware that people that are under stress sort of reach out take the temperature of not the physical temperature, but the emotional temperature of the people in your life and, um, you know, make sure that whoever's having a bad day, you try to help them through it because, uh, you know, we're all going to have some bad days in the next few months or so. Another question is, can you speak to some of the issues and concerns about public transportation now and as more businesses begin to reopen? And I just want to ask uh, you each, I think the best way to answer that question is how you each are personally handling this. Like, what are your thoughts about when you'll be comfortable going back on the T or, or working in an office? I can start. I, you know, I, um, I have, I, I have a lot of. I, I've got a job. One that's a that's a luxury in this in this particular time. I have a job I can do from home, and if I want to go into work, I'm living in Central Boston, so I can actually walk to the office. I can ride my bike to the office. Not a lot of people can do that. Um, I. I would certainly understand how people would be concerned about getting on like a crowded red line or orange line train in the foreseeable future. I would think in the, um, you know, in the winter, if there's an upsurge of cases, uh, I'm not certain a, a public transit train is going to be where I'm going to want to be, but um that's not a choice everybody has. It's like not an option for everybody. I, 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 I'm not certain how we're going to handle this. I don't think I've seen anybody address uh, 
this in a real um, way other than, you know, the fact that the New York City subway has um, is closing for a few hours every night to, to clean cars. I guess that's a start, but I don't think that's the, the big picture solution. I don't know. David, do you have thoughts? What's your sense? Well, I, I agree with you. Um, and it, it's a step in the right direction, but it isn't sufficient to really reduce the spread. Um, if, if on a typical um, crowded train or bus, um, you are sitting, you're not social distancing, and you are sitting closer to individuals, you're also in, in very enclosed space. So yeah. that is, the, those are conditions that would facilitate um, the, the, the spread of the virus. And I think in the context of work, getting back to work, I, I assume that maybe we'll be back in the office to some degree um, um, this summer. Um, but my assumption would be that even when we do this, we would do it in stages, that we might, we might begin with maybe only a quarter of the people who normally would work in the building would be there at any given time, whether we have a shift system or we have people work at home and then um, uh, 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 on alternate days or, or, or something. I, I think we have to return um, but we have to return slowly. We need to monitor what is happening. I, this is a brave new world we're in until we have these vaccines. Right. And and it, it, it will be, um, I, I don't think there's the option of no risk, but I think we need to take all the steps we can to minimize risk. Is it your sense that people are too cavalier and aren't aware of the risks, or is that not a fair statement to say? I, I think what I've heard from public opinion polls, I, I think most Americans are uh, aware of the risks. Many are uncomfortable with what is happening in, in many states where governors feel it's, it's time to open up. Um, but I think there clearly is division. We've seen the protests of those who are asking for the country to be reopened. So I, I think it's a mixed bag, but I, I think most people take this seriously. The, the, the level of death and suffering we have seen. I, I haven't quite seen anything quite like this in my lifetime. When, when you both, when David, you're talking about a brave new world, and I, I look at the two of you, and you're both such authorities in different ways on on health, and as have have explored this world for so many for decades. How does it? It must feel unsettled for both of you to not have answers about where this is going or when, because you're two people. Who, who know more than most of us? I, I would say, and then then Helen, please jump, chime in. I, I would say that we 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 don't know have all the answers now, but we know a lot, and I, I I'm privileged to be part of a community of public health where they're experts at, at my school in, in so many different areas, and and I can I can learn from them. So we know enough to take the threat seriously. We know enough to know what are the steps we can take to reduce our risk as individuals and to re reduce our risk as, as communities. So, and, and, and there is work taking place down the line to, to develop treatments, uh, effective treatments, to develop effective vaccines. So as I look to the future, I, I, I look to the future with optimism, but I, I think Given what we know about the nature of this virus, we, we shouldn't take things for granted and we shouldn't declare victory too early. Okay. So in terms of me, um, I covered the 2003 SARS outbreak. I was based in Toronto at the time and Toronto was the um, only center outside of Asia to have like a full fledged outbreak, um, hundreds of cases. I quickly learn that, you know, when you have a new virus, you don't know all the answers and you acquire them as you go. And sometimes you think you learn something only to find out it wasn't true and knowledge is accrued and, and you know, thinking shifts. So I actually am not terribly surprised that we don't have answers now. I, uh, I think it's amazing how much has come into focus in such a very, very short period of time. This is a brand new virus. Um, I understand the frustration, certainly. Like, it would love, be lovely to know if there's going to be a summer lull and people could think about, you know, maybe seeing family or, or you know, 
taking a few more risks because the there will be less risk of transmission but we won't know till we know it's it's a, the same thing with you know the question of whether or not this virus uh, infection with this virus induces immunity it probably induces some immunity for a very for a short period of time if if it induces uh, immunity for a number of years that would be great but we won't know that till we know that and um that just takes time and that's the nature of uh you know a pandemic with a new virus let me go to a final question that sort of looks ahead where one of one, one of the audience members says people say things will never be the same the do you anticipate that with a successful safe vaccine people eventually that eventually many aspects of modern life in the united states like concerts and sports events will return to a form of normal perhaps the handshake is now history this audience member says but what is there anything else that will never be the same i i would go back to helen's uh, famous words we don't know for sure until we know on the one hand this could be a, a september 11 2001 type moment that that changed the way we fly mm -hmm. there could be some precautions that are implemented that 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 didn't exist before COVID-19, that will stay with us. It certainly is my expectation that I'll, compared to how we are living now, that a lot of things will be more back to normal than they are now. But you, you are absolutely correct. Um, there could be some long-term changes. And I, at this moment, I don't know that we are 100% sure of what they are. Yeah, I would agree. I think, um... I think it's going to take a, long, a while for things to sort of settle out. I think, you know, as I mentioned earlier, the goal with vaccine isn't just to vaccinate the United States. The, vac the rest of the world needs, needs a vaccine. Until the rest of the world is vaccinated, it's hard to imagine people feeling safe to go on a European summer vacation, for instance, or to Bali to go surfing or whatever, you know, that kind of that part of life i think is going to be on hold for a while and d what comes out the other end i think will depend on how long it's on hold i mean if it takes a number of years to get vaccine you know people may just feel a lot less comfortable with things like flying um and there may be a lot fewer airlines you know when this is done, which might mean that air travel could be a lot more expensive. Um, it's it's hard to predict the future. You, you could imagine it would go one way and then be entirely wrong. So I'm not sure I want to stick my neck out too far. And let me, and this is a totally unfair question to asking you to stick your neck out again, but, but I'll go back to this person's question. Is the handshake in your view um, now history? Um, you know, after SARS-1, which didn't last as long, people talked about bumping elbows and coughing into your el your sleeve and stuff, and people still don't do that. Um, I don't know. I, I, I'll reserve judgment. Yeah, I, I don't know either. I suspect that a handshake will be back. Uh, it's, it's been such a part of human interaction. I think in the early days, I would forget that I'm not supposed to shake others' hands when I met them before we were, you know, social distancing and working from home. It, it's, it's, it's just such a part of our human interaction. I, I heard in Italy, it was a very big challenge early in the, in the pandemic in Italy. I also think people are going to crave human contact. Exactly. In, in the final minute we have, um, can I ask you each to say something reassuring to our audience? I think we'll get through this. I think that we're not through it and we've got a long way to go, but we're going to get through it. I, I agree that we will get through it. I think one of the things the pandemic has taught us that um, it, it doesn't discriminate, it's, it's, it's hurting all of us. And one of the things we need to do is to come together as a nation, come together as a community. Let's invest to create all of the opportunities for all of us to reduce our risk of health, uh, a risk of disease and illness. 
well spoken. Thank you both. You both you're both so thoughtful and eloquent and and I've learned a lot and I'm sure our audience has too. So thank you so much and be safe out there and have a nice evening. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.